So you have a patient in shock and they're hypotensive and they can be volume overloaded and you need to figure out why. How do you do this? There has to be a systematic approach to do this. And that's what Dr. Sanusi is going to talk about now. The congestion cascade is a very important way of looking at hemodynamics. It's a change in the framework, a paradigm shift in thinking when it comes to assessing a patient who's in undifferentiated shock. You're looking at the hemodynamic, the cardiovascular system as different congestion points and you are the plumber and it's your job to find out where that mechanical obstruction lies. Why am I a plumber? You're a plumber because this is basic, simple hemodynamics. When you're assessing a patient who's in undifferentiated shock or is congested and you don't know where it is, always start with the aortic valve. Is this aortic valve stenose? Does it look thickened? Does it look like the valve leaflets are not opening? And there's no forward flow or stroke volume. This may very well be the reason you have all the shock and the congestion. I need to look at that aortic valve. I need to assess that aortic valve. A lot of the therapeutics for this may involve percutaneous intervention, may involve surgery as well. If your aortic valve has severe regurgitation, that's causing hemodynamic compromise or congestion, this is a possible indication for surgical evaluation. This is still within the confines or realms of point of care ultrasound. You are looking for pathologies that will alter and change your management. Step two, you're going to take a look at the left ventricular outflow tract. Outflow tract right before the aortic valve is obstructed. For example, they have a very thick septum. Patients who have thick septums are susceptible to outflow tract obstruction occurring during systole. The treatment would be increasing fluids, increasing preload. We start giving them pressors. We start minimizing the use of inotropes and using pure vasoconstrictors such as vasopressin. If I give a patient with dynamic LVOT tract obstruction inotropes, why am I in trouble? You're going to be in trouble because what you're going to induce is even worsening outflow tract obstruction. Oh. Because the LV is so hyperdynamic, it is causing your outflow tract, like a garden hose, just to completely collapse during systole. So when there's supposed to be flow coming out of there, you actually, it's completely impeded and walled off. Step three, the LV. How is the global function of the LV? Is it good or bad? You're looking at both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. So global systolic function is something that we're used to picking up. More mortality when you're in the ICU and you have diastolic dysfunction. Regional wall motion abnormalities can sometimes point towards uh, certain occlusions in coronary arteries. And again, it changes management. Most of the flow that occurs during diastole is through the mitral valve. Use echocardiography to try and see and detect whether the patient has any severe MR. By placing a pulse wave Doppler on the mitral valve inflow leaflets, you can actually start to see mitral valve inflow patterns. And this gives us an incredible amount of information about left-sided filling pressures. You can have someone who looks like they have ARDS, but basically they have severe MR that's undiagnosed. Look at the valves, understand their structure, put color Doppler to try to detect that mitral regurgitation. Knowing what your left-sided filling pressures are guides you in terms of management. Front row seats to the left atrium and left atrial pressure, and that's the pulmonary veins. We all know that the pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium. If the left atrium has high pressures, guess what? The pulmonary veins are going to start showing very clear changes in the waveforms that indicate higher pressures. This is the barometer to your left atrium similar to the hepatic veins, but it looks reversed. This is a natural flow. This is the reversal wave that happens when the atria contracts. And this is systolic forward flow. And this is diastolic forward flow. When you have severe mitral regurgitation or when you have increase in left ventricular in diastolic and left atrial pressures, what happens to this waveform? It becomes biphasic. This is good, this is bad. Pulsatility like this where you have biphasic waveforms tells you that you probably have high pressures on this side. Next stop is lung ultrasonography. Using ultrasound to see whether or not the patient has beelines, for example. But again, 
This is a warning. You need to assess beelines in concordance to some means or measurement of left-sided filling pressures. I could have two different patients, all with a beeline pattern bilaterally. One patient has evidence of high left-sided filling pressures, one patient does not. What does that mean? That means one has cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the other one does not, okay? Now there's other ways by looking at the pleural line, looking at gap lesions, looking at scattered lesions around the lung, but in general, you need to assess some form of what? Left-sided filling pressures along with the lung as well. Well, the pulmonary artery, especially if you're able to get good views of the pulmonary artery and specifically the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery, by using simple techniques like color flow Doppler, you can actually detect proximal large saddle embolism, which again is a very important determination when you're going down that congestion cascade. Someone who has a saddle embolism will go down a different treatment pathway, such as TPA or catheter-directed thrombolytics, etc. It changes your management, and so that's why it's one of the key points. So now we start moving back. This is the right ventricular outflow tract, okay? You can also use pulse wave Doppler and one very important finding is that the Doppler waveform should be parabolic, and this is good. That means you don't really have high resistance. You don't have high pulmonary vascular resistance. And looking at those waveforms, they give you an incredible amount of information about pulmonary artery hemodynamics, your pulmonary circulation. Once you start to see an accelerated waveform that has notching, this is bad. You can see it in patients who have pulmonary hypertension. You can see it in patients who have any reason to have high PA pressures, like so PE, for example, you can detect this kind of waveform. All of these things can be gleaned through RVOT Doppler. Next is the right ventricle. The right ventricle is something that has really gained a lot of popularity, and rightfully so, because it's been neglected for the longest time. Taking a look at RV function, assessing TAPSI, looking at the tricuspid valve. Understanding RV function, understanding RV structure is very, very important. In one of our upcoming episodes, we are going to delve in deeply, in full detail about the right ventricle and how to assess the right ventricle. This is a very important part of the congestion cascade and something that we have to deal with very carefully. Next is the tricuspid valve. Like any valve in the heart, you need to interrogate this valve very closely. You're looking for severe tricuspid regurgitation. You are looking for perhaps infective endocarditis. And lastly, by estimating the gradients using Doppler, you can come up with an estimation of pulmonary pressures as well. And from there, you can put color Doppler, which will help define the regurgitant jet or flow. And then from there, you can estimate gradients by using continuous wave Doppler. Next is the IVC. And the IVC is a very interesting vascular structure. The IVC tells us nothing more than what right-sided filling pressures are. It doesn't tell us much about volume status. If you have RV failure, you're gonna have high filling pressures here. Your IVC may become plump, but there's no change in total body volume. If a patient suddenly has obstructive shock with the PE, right-sided filling pressures go up, the IVC becomes plump, the volume status didn't really change. The only thing that changed was the filling pressures because of that obstructive congestive point. Obstructive shock due to tamponade, obstructive shock due to pneumothorax, obstructive shock due to pulmonary embolism should always lead to a large IVC. If they have a collapsible IVC and a pericardial effusion, you likely do not have tamponade. The IVC gives us a lot of information, but the IVC's usefulness can be invalidated with stuff like positive pressure, for example. So it's usually not helpful unless we're talking about the extremes, meaning that a completely virtual non-existent IVC versus an extremely large plump IVC. But to make a statements about volume st status, we need to be very, very careful by looking at specific hepatic vein, portal vein Doppler, and interrenal venous Doppler, we can get considerably more information about congestion in these specific organs. The hepatic vein, the opposite of that pulmonary vein, atrial retrograde, and this is how it looks like. Your A wave, your S wave, and your D wave. As your volume starts to build up, your S wave becomes blunted. S is less than D. And as the volume increases even more, complete reversal, systolic flow reversal. 
then we can target that and we mostly try to target normalization of waveforms. This is bad, just like it was bad right here. Likely patient has a combination of tricuspid regurgitation, a bad RV, high PA pressures, whatever the reason is, you now have evidence hemodynamic Doppler evidence that suggests that there's high pressures. But it doesn't stop there because you could have completely normal pressures and just a completely flail, destroyed, perforated tricuspid valve that has regurgitation. Guess what? You may still have a little bit of flow reversal or blunting, but your filling pressures may not be high. So we need to look at a different venous system. And this is where the portal system comes into play. In the portal system, the flow is very different. In the portal system, normal flow is monophasic flow. It's like a venous hum. It's like a little waterfall. As fluid starts to build up and patients become more congested, you develop some pulsatility. But as it gets worse and worse, you even start developing this. If you see patients with portal veins that look like this, that are pulsatile, then you know that they're volume overloaded and you're going to use a combination of an understanding of the hepatic and the portal vein to decide whether or not you're going to diurese them. How do we see this clinically? Biochemical evidence, AST, ALT starts to go up, your creatinine starts to worsen, and all of this is due to congestion. In this case with the portal vein, if you have completely biphasic waveforms, that's telling you that this patient's flanknic circulation is completely congested. So what do we do? We need to diurese these patients or other forms of volume removal like renal replacement therapy. The kidney is a very important organ as we all know, and the kidney forms the last step in the congestion cascade. The kidney is very important because it's an encapsulated organ, so any kind of congestion is going to lead to dysfunction in this organ. How do we pick this up? We use intrarenal venous Doppler. These are the vascular structures within the kidneys that have characteristic flow patterns that can tell us a lot of information about congestion. When you look at it, there are two different flow patterns. Pattern that is above the baseline, and that is the, the arteries that you see, the renal arterioles, and then you have the flow which is below the baseline. The flow that's below the baseline is the thing that we're really going to focus on. And the most important thing you have to consider is that there's continuous flow throughout the cardiac cycle. That is good vascular flow in your kidneys. Once you start to see interrupted or discontinuous flow, that's when you know that congestion has started to worsen. So it starts to look biphasic and then in even severe forms, you start to just see monophasic waveforms. And that's the spectrum that you're going to see. Monophasic continuous flow, interrupted discontinuous flow, that's biphasic, followed by monophasic flow, each representing worsening congestion. So just like we deal with other congestion parameters, this may be an indication that the patient is volume overloaded and may need some form of volume removal. The way we assess volume status is by looking at congestion in specific organs. I'm not asking you to do every single congestion point every single time a patient comes in with shock, but you need to start selecting certain uh, high yield examination. I have someone who has completely normal lungs, right? You could probably say that this side is normal. You don't have hemodynamically significant aortic stenosis. But when I start to see a big IVC, hepatic flow reversal, then you need to really start to dive into the congestion points that are proximal to it. So for example, IVC is big, hepatic vein show flow reversal, immediately rear your head towards what's going on with the tricuspid valve, what's going on with the RV, and take a look at the RVOT as well. When you're initially assessing a patient, you have to rule out those very time-sensitive diagnoses, like PE, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, a lot of the history, the physical, the laboratory uh, information is going to point in certain directions like sepsis and endocrinopathies or anaphylactic shock, etc. The overall global view of the congestion cascade is a very clear, systematic approach 
when assessing a patient who's either in shock or who has congestion to try and figure out where along the cardiovascular system this mechanical obstruction lies. Once you're able to focus and hone in on that obstruction, that's when you can start doing the right therapies for the patient. So over the course of the next few months, we're gonna go through each and every one of these congestion points and take a deep dive to understand how and what to do when we face these situations. Critical care isn't about who's smartest, it's about who does things systematically.